slog through traffic, etc. It's truly a joy. Um, so I'm going to read for, uh, from a few little places in the book, and then I hope we can have a conversation. I hope you'll think about some questions you might have and that we can have an exchange, because for me, that is always one of the richest parts of these evenings and these opportunities, is being able to hear from you and being able to have an exchange about the book, the content and themes of the book, writing, um, and any and all things related. So you've already gotten a little bit of a thumbnail about the opening of the novel, the essentials of the plot of the novel. Um, Leda arrives at 17 to Buenos Aires um, in 1913, which is a time when the tango was just rising up. And um, she arrives in Buenos Aires. It's a, a city where the southern side of town, San Telmo, La Boca, San Cristobal are neighbors, neighborhoods that are crowded with immigrants, absolutely full of immigrants um, from different uh, European countries, uh, some from Lebanon, uh, Arabic-speaking folks. Uh, there are people of African descent who have been in uh, Argentina for a long time already, uh, descended from enslaved people. Very few people know that at the turn of the 20th century, Buenos Aires was one-third black. And Afro-Argentinians are um, a really important part of the musical roots of the tango, as well as all of these other immigrant groups. The tango really arose from the cultural cauldron that was um, the poor side of town in Buenos Aires. So this first moment is when Lida has first arrived and the other women in her conventillo or tenement have told her not to go out by herself on the street except to buy bread and come right home. So this is the first time that she breaks that rule and goes for a walk. She set out down the block, crossed the street and kept walking. People streaming everywhere, women in doorways, old men in cafes or pushing ramshackle hand carts, calling out, not in Italian but in Spanish, that strange language that sounded like the Italian of an alternate planet, a planet of drunkards, perhaps. Already she understood more glimmers of it, which meant she was either learning Spanish or getting drunk on this place, or both. Her ear caught shreds of other languages. She heard a woman in a doorway speaking sounds unlike anything she'd heard before, at once angular and melodic. For all she knew, it could be the tongue of demons or the gods. Further on, children called to their mothers from inside the house, in Spanish, Italian, another unknown tongue. Two girls with baskets walked purposefully past her, gossiping in French. At a cafe, an old man told a joke in the Neapolitan dialect to a group of men who laughed appreciatively. More Napolitanos. She had imagined in her brief visit to Naples that that would be all she'd see of the city, but Naples had followed her across the ocean. It surrounded her. It had invaded Buenos Aires. And isn't that strange, she thought, the way one city can swirl inside another, the way you can be in one country yet carry another country in your skin, the way a place is changed by whoever comes to it, the way silt invades the body of a river. She was that, a speck of silt. The thought thrilled her, but it also made her want to weep without reason or for reasons utterly unknown to her. With every immigrant she passed, she longed to stop and stare into his or her face and ask with nothing but her gaze, and you? What are you here for? Why did you come? As though just looking at them might unlatch the trap doors to their hidden stories. And the stories would be infinite, no two alike burning with hope and loss and vigorous despair, told in more dialects than even God could possibly speak. And yet, she suddenly saw, it was possible that somewhere beneath the surface, all their hidden stories held the same thread, a single hum of longing. I came to live. Surely this was true for all of them, including her. And Buenos Aires, tell me, is there any chance that I can forge a space for myself somewhere in the folds of you? She turned a corner and kept walking. The voices of the city blended and poured into her, filling her up, radiant, sweetly fatal. And that was when she understood that whatever this city was, whatever it held, 
She wanted it, all of it. She wanted Buenos Aires inside her, around her, covering her skin like a film of sweat. She wanted the breath of this city in her lungs, no matter the danger, no matter the other story about the good girl who stays locked inside with needle and thread until she can get back to her home village. To hell with that story. She wanted freedom, wanted to taste this place, even if it killed her. So Leda does not stay a good girl, and it doesn't kill her. And her strategy for survival is to put on men's clothes and sneak out of the tenement where she lives and at 3 in the morning and go to another neighborhood and start a new life as a man called Dante. The other piece of her survival is that she's obsessed with the tango, and which surrounds her, and which is being played mostly in CD cafes and brothels and dance halls where respectable women can't go. Um, and it is only being played, the instruments are only played by men. So with her new identity as a man, she starts to play with orchestras, quartets, trios that play at these different locales. And um, this is a little excerpt, fast forward, fast forward, of her life as a tango musician. She wanted it always, every bit of it. The blistered fingers and sore feet and arms aching from holding up that damn blessed violin. The long, endless chain of nights performing until the sun came up as if only their music could make the light return. Her new orchestra's sound tightened over the months, fusing into a shape that could curl and soar and sting. They played and played for arrogant and easy crowds alike. Then she'd walk home on streets dipped in the liquid gold of morning, looking around, dazed, amazed at the city that had taken her in and given her a way to survive, at least so far. Because no day was promised, nights even less so, it was not a safe city. It was full of edges on which you could cut yourself or trip and fall quick and lost right down to hell, which made each breath of Buenos Aires air an act of grace. There were mornings when Dante came home to her matchbox of a room, unbound her breasts and lay her head down in wonder. One more night, one more stony dawn, a gift so large it seemed untenable. She earned her bread with her violin, a miracle that seemed as large as loaves and fishes. She was able to quit the factory, as Santiago had said, and live in a manner she hadn't known was possible, from music and for music. For what happened when bodies filled the dance halls and the tango gripped them like a beautiful curse, propelled them around the room in pairs, bodies caught in the fierce language of dance. The room disappears. The world disappears. All things give way to a single bright circuit of light between two dancers. She knew how it felt. She danced it too. She also knew that the feeling of the world reduced to two and two alone was an illusion because no couple generated the dance on its own. There was no tango without music, and the music came from her, from them, the music makers. She pressed her strings and 50 women's shapely ankles moved in time, 50 lovely backs arched, 50 thighs lifted along trousered legs, oh, bless, <coughs> kick, hook, sliding. Bodies pressing as she pressed the sweet neck of her instrument and watched from the stage. Hold her close, compadre, she would think. Flick your leg between hers. Press her so gently to the left that she believes the turn is born from her own will. Hold the small of her back like it's the core of every pleasure on this earth, and I will give you my sound over and over night after night. My sound will move you. My sound will guide you. My sound, through you, makes love to her. So this last piece I'll read is um, 
Dante, also known as Leda, is getting into a bit of a pickle because these men with whom she's in a tango orchestra, a really promising orchestra led by an Afro-Argentinian called Santiago, who's ambitious about launching them into the elite cabarets that are starting to crop up on the rich side of town because the tango has caught on in Paris. That happened in 1913. And when the tango caught on in Paris, the elite of Buenos Aires said, my god, this dance that's been under our feet that we've been looking down on and disdaining this whole time, um, maybe we should pay attention. So that's his ambition. Her challenge is, in this moment is that she, her fellow musicians, one of the ways that they bond after work is that they go to brothels together. And she's terrified of going to a brothel with them because she's terrified of um, blowing her disguise, of course. She's also terrified because she's discovering within herself attraction to women. And this is something with which she's at war with herself and she's trying to repress. She's also terrified because when she looks at prostitutes in all of these places where she works, what she sees is women who are exploited, who are dead inside, and she doesn't want to be part of that. Um, she sort of wants to protect them from that, but that is also something that is in conflict with the feelings that she has. So this is the first time that she, hi guys, oh my god, he's gotten so big. <laughs> so. Um, just when I'm starting the racy part. I know. They're, they're <laughs> so this is, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a moment when, uh, when Dante, this is the last uh, scene, a scene that I'll read, um, and then we can talk. This is a, a scene in which she realizes that she just sort of can't fight it anymore, that actually um, the fellow musicians will become suspicious if she doesn't come. So she comes with them to a uh, brothel for the first time. After work that night, they went to Lo de Amalia, a dance hall where they played in the past with several back rooms that almost verged on clean. They arrived at 6.30 in the morning when the dancing public had mostly dispersed and left the working girls to focus on the back room side of business. The hall was crowded, dimly lit, and smelled of beer and kerosene. Dante found it difficult to breathe in the close air, or perhaps because of her own fear. She followed the musicians to a little table and sat down stiffly. A whore soon slung her arm around her neck, and fortunately, she had plenty of life in her eyes. She was pretty in a moon-faced, thick-bodied kind of way. She was older than most of her fellow prostitutes, 30 or perhaps even older a seasoned woman who'd seen a thing or two and hadn't let them break her. You, pretty boy, she said, you'll be coming with me. She said it with the tone a mother might use to tell a child to wash his face. She sat down in Dante's lap and pushed her ample breasts against him. There's a good boy. She swelled of, smelled of sweat and cinnamon. Dante felt dizzy. This woman, so much of her, so very close, She'd sworn she wouldn't touch a woman, but she wasn't the one touching now, was she, when this woman had come over of her own accord and didn't seem fragile either, just the opposite, solid as an oak. The men soon headed to the back rooms. Dante followed them right behind the moon-faced woman, hoping that the walls weren't too thin, though they were bound to be, and that her silence wouldn't raise suspicion. Her whole body felt tight, and she fought back waves of panic with each step. She just wanted to get through the session without being discovered. It was a long haul, she thought, a long way to run if she was found out, and a far longer way to find a corner of this land where she could hope to start again. When Dante and the woman arrived in the dim room, Dante whispered, lie here with me. Silly boy, what else would we do? No, I mean, just lie down, Not, nothing else. What's the matter? Is it sore? Got the clap? Dante shrugged. The woman laughed and lay down. The walls were thin, and Loro was next door, already grunting. Dante lay down on the thin mattress next to the woman. What's your name? She whispered. Everybody calls me Mamita. She was a lovely woman, even more so now, 
relaxed against the bed as if about to dream. Dante didn't mean to touch, but her hands ran, ran along Mamita's body lightly, loosened her bodice. This didn't count, did it? You're warm, Mamita. That's just the first of it. Does it hurt? Does what it hurt? Your tool. Uh, it, uh, n no, no, not much. You sure? Don't want me to kiss it and make it better? No, thanks, really. I made you shy. <laughs> no. Her hand was inside Mamita's bodice now, stroking her breasts, returning over and over to the miraculous nipples. She was not allowed. She had to stop. Every fiber in her body blazed with pleasure. I did, Mamita was laughing. You're just a boy, aren't you? She was looking at Dante with wide brown eyes, half mocking, half nurturing. She's joking around with me, Dante thought with a shock. She even seems like she might, stranger than strange, be enjoying herself. Imagine that. A whore who was alive inside, who laughed and seemed to mean it. The breasts were freed from their bodice now. I'm not hurting you. Hurting me with those little paws? I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to hurt you. Oh, you poor dear. You don't know a thing. Look, you've only got a couple of minutes left. You hear your friend finishing up in there, and you've been paddling in the shallows like a baby. So I'll give you a little something. I'll tell you a secret. Come here. Dante bent close to Mamita and met her eyes. Are you listening? Dante nodded. Now I'm doing you a big favor telling you this because most ladies, they won't ever admit to it, not directly. It's just something you have to be a man about. Understand? She nodded again. It's fine to pet them softly like you're doing, but it's also boring. A lot of ladies like a little bite. Take the nipple between your thumb and finger. Give it a good long pinch. Next door, the groaning had given way to silence. Do it! Dante obeyed, gingerly. No, harder. She did it a little harder. Pathetic! You call yourself a man? Harder! Hard as you can! Dante did as she was told, and Mamita arched her back and shut her eyes and made a long, sharp sound, as pure as it was beautiful. For an instant, it even seemed that the artifice between them the distance made by the roles they were acting had dropped away and that they were elsewhere together on a great sea, Dante a raft, Mamita the bright water itself. Then the room returned. Mamita opened her eyes and stared vacantly for a moment at a point on the wall. Then she returned to Dante with a look of amusement. Well, look at you, little devil. Dante didn't know what to say. Her mind groped for words, stumbling. Your time's up. Oh, yes. She rose shakily and reached for her hat. Thanks for the secret. Don't forget it. How could I, Dante thought and would have said. But Mamita was already closing up her bodice with business-like gestures that made Dante feel thrown out like a dog. She walked out on unsteady legs. The hall shimmered strangely. Pedro and El Loro were leaning against the wall, waiting. Santiago had not yet returned. What did you do to her, Dante? The question she dreaded. El Loro staring, waiting for an answer. And if they knew that she hadn't, that she couldn't, the world would crumble all around her. To make her scream like that, come on, tell us how you did it. It was not suspicion on El Loro's face, but admiration. His girl had been silent the whole time. Even Pedro was looking at her with an expression of grudging curiosity. A new Dante smiled now, cocked his hat on his head, and drew himself up tall. Boys, you know what they say. I'm a gentleman. I'll never tell. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I just wanted to make an observation. Oh, um, right, go it's for it. So, it's such a joy to see you and see you read. I'm just so happy. It's so great to, to see to, you too. To, to get to do this. Um, so I am still earlier in the book, but I love that. Um, Sorry about the some almost some spoiler. spoiler. Yeah, there's, plenty I, 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 <laughs> there's plenty more after that. There's plenty more after that. It's a good teaser, yeah. but um, but I just read the passage where um, she's really just started to play violin, and she takes to that, or she has a kind of natural gift for it, in the same way that she's sort of in the in this sexual space, very um, it becomes sort of very familiar for her in a way, or that it comes to her very um, with shame, but then a kind of natural fluidity. So there's something nice for me in that reflection mm. that I was seeing. Does that, would, do you, did you, is that there or am I uh, off on a tangent on my own? I don't, so you're certainly not on a tangent on your own. Um, I, you know, and I, I appreciate you saying that. I think that there's a, there's a sort of tandem journey, you know, um, that, that Leda is on. You know, she's hungry for music and she's also hungry to, to sort of, fully come into her skin as all of who she is and with her erotic desires that radically go against the conventions of her place and time. Mm -hmm. And and those journeys are not unconnected mm -hmm. for her, both because I think, you know, for those of us who are artists and, and feel creative urges inside of us, being an artist feels like it bucks convention. It's something we long for, it's something that we can feel joyous about um, in a manner that is maybe not entirely separate from erotic energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that those things are necessarily entirely separate urges for, for some of us. Those of you who are also artists in the room can, can, can feel free to chime in in the conversation on that level. Um, but I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a double journey of coming into who she really is and, and, and they, are, they are related mm -hmm. uh, within her consciousness. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. With her body. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's sort of this double thing, you know. I think for, you know, we know, we know, we know that there have been queer people mm -hmm. forever, mm -hmm. that there have always been gay, lesbian, bisexual people, that there have always been people who would be most comfortable somewhere on the transgender spectrum, um, even though, you know, these, uh, there's much silence in history about those experiences. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I wanted to write my way into with this book uh, was really giving voice to those voids, those silences. You know, we, we, in the time, in the 1910s in Buenos Aires, nobody was collecting primary research interviews with people who had queer desires. Mm -hmm. This doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I looked. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell you that the, the research of the time didn't happen, it doesn't exist. So I think fiction can be a vehicle for, for, for filling that in. I think fiction, I personally believe that fiction has an important role to play in, in filling those silences in history and, and giving shape to those lost um, stories. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what was the, the nub of the um, story that made you write the novel? The very, very first nub was 17-year-old girl from a tiny town in southern Italy on a steamship on her way to meet her cousin who's going to be her husband, never going back to Italy, part of this great migration wave um, to Buenos Aires. That was the very first thing, and that seed came from one of the stories of my family, or so my great-grandmother. That part is true about my great grandmother. Oh, oh, oh. Except she arrived and her cousin was alive and well, and she married him and had four children. One of them was my grandfather. So certainly, you know, it parts ways. I don't think anyone, in any of my relatives, would argue that this is, you know, an exact replica of my great grandmother's story. But that was the first seed, mm -hmm. um, and then from that, that, like you said, that nub came. You know, this desire to place her in that place and time know all about that place and time, ask myself what that might have been like. And I, you know, for me at least, this reson resonates, and I hope with readers as well, with more universal questions about migration and how it transforms a person, how a person can carry multiple cultures in their skin, 
how migration you know, shapes a culture in some ways that are invisible or thankless or denied and yet so vivid and true. I think we're seeing that um, in our contemporary 21st century society in so many ways. You know, from boats leaving Northern Africa for Italy to you know things happening within our borders here in the U.S. What does it mean to be an immigrant or to be part of an immigrant group? How does a culture get transformed by the presence of immigrants, including how is a culture nourished and enriched by that presence? And the story of the music of the tango is, in so many ways, a story about that richness and resilience that can come from from an immigrant reality. So, um, so the dango very quickly became an important center of gravity for the book as well. But the very first nub was <coughs> this 17-year-old girl arriving in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then where did the nub come from that she would find herself as a woman where everything is forbidden and make mm -hmm. that leap across the street to cross-dressing? That, I mean, that yeah, me. yeah, right. <laughs> like, what that? So I was sketching a great deal. When I say sketching, just like really doing a lot of free writing, a lot of rough writing, really exploring the possibilities for this book, um, for that landscape, researching the tango, researching the migration from Italy, researching in English, Spanish, and Italian, and on three continents, and just writing, writing, writing. And, and, I, and there were other possibilities. But when I explored the possibility of it being a woman who enters the tango world, and you know, even just a few months into my research, it was very clear that, unless I set the story later in the 1930s, when the tango was already seen as glamorous and was really some, a lot closer to what we know of it today, I really, and, and that, wasn't, that wasn't where the heat was for me. The heat was in exploring what the tango was before you know, um, before it sort of had that establishment piece, when it was really, when it really belonged to the people, for the people, when it was unvarnished, when it was a dangerous demi-monde, you know. Um, I, I wanted to write about that, the birth of it. And in order to write that, um, either it was going to be a male character who was going to be part of this, these tangled troops, uh, or it was going to be a, a woman who was going to sort of infiltrate with a masculine identity because um, because it was such a so once I started once I sketched that possibility well what if this you know well what if it's her and she and very early explorations I thought well maybe this 17 year old arrives and then her son becomes a tango musician and I sort of wrote that a little yeah okay you know and then when I started writing that it's still her and it's earlier on and she cross dresses then then all of a sudden the story really had heat and took a life of its own and so it just was where I had to go so I followed it yeah. So I followed it. I didn't know at first, you know, what her desires would be. It could be this. It could be again, really following the the heat um, and where it felt like I could best explore the themes and questions. Great. Yeah, that's what happened. Anyone else? Yes. I've been hearing about you from Irma Herrera and Irma oh, Gonzalez. Oh, how so, lovely! So nice to meet you. Do you Likewise. Dance, do you dance the tango? Um, you know, I'm not a big, regular tango dancer, um, and I'm not so much of a natural dancer. Uh, the first time I remember dancing tango was at a milonga in Buenos Aires. My cousin, I have a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles in Buenos Aires, and they always help me research my books. They're such good sports. My relatives in Uruguay as well. Uh, but in this case, my cousin Diego took me dancing in a milonga in Buenos Aires where there were no tourists, and it was this very underground, it was a warehouse with no windows, you know, nothing on the walls, kind of like a rave, you know, like very underground, very under, as we say in Argentina. It was very under. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and it was just incredible, you know, absolutely crowded at three in the morning, and he was very patient with you know, showing me the ropes. And for me, that's still my favorite time when I danced the tango, you know, it was nothing, it wasn't about the lessons, it wasn't about the witch high heels, it wasn't about the red flower in the hair, it was just like people out being with the music and the dance. And um, I did take tango lessons, uh, private classes, private dance classes in Uruguay while I was researching this book and writing the book, because I knew I had to get it more deeply in my body. So I did study the dance myself directly as part of researching this book. I also listened to a lot of tango, of course. Um, I interviewed musicologists and violinists and 
um, had them read my manuscript when they were willing. I took violin classes uh, from a professional tango violinist, again in Uruguay. I was living in Uruguay for a year and a half while I was writing this book. So, um, so that was invaluable. Uh, because you know, the, there's just so many people in Uruguay who really carry the tango heritage and it's very central to the culture way. And so, um, so I took classes with the tango violinist, like I said, and he informed the book very much, as, as did my direct experience with the instrument. So yes, there's layers to that. And I grew up with the tango always in my home as an immigrant kid with Rio Platense parents. Um, Rio Platense is a word that means of the Rio de la Plata. So it means people from Argentina and Uruguay. I'll teach you that word because <laughs> then you'll know I'm a Rio Platense person. And so uh, as, a, as a Rio Platense immigrant, you know, the tango was always around. You know, there was a sheet music uh, from one of my grandfathers who had written tangos in his spare time. And, uh, you know, he had gotten a song published and it hung in my kitchen growing up. And my, Father would sing his mother's favorite tango around the house, especially in the years after he di she died. She died when I was seven, and I can just remember, you know, like in his little off-key voice. Fumando espero al hombre que yo quiero tras los cristales, etc., etc., etc. And that song would sometimes like just come into my mind unasked when I was writing the book. And sort of my, my grandma's favorite tango. And I only have about two memories of this grandma, so, you know. It's a lot of weaving into my life, the tango, beyond the dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for reading. You have a beautiful voice. Oh, thank you. And the way you. that you read is just delightful to listen to. Thank you for saying that. I, it means a lot. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Thank you for listening <laughs> to the reading. I'm grateful. I'm glad. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, it's up to you, but I wanted to thank you also for your essay in the Sunday Chronicle. Oh, yeah. Let's leap. Leap there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying that. Yeah, I'm so excited to see, you know, this, to see someone say, well, yes, To Kill a Mockingbird is the great white satisfying race novel that makes white people feel good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here's one dealing with the real unvarnished, less varnished. Mm -hmm conflicts mm -hmm. and regrets and families and yes yes <laughs> good <laughs> so I, what she's referencing is uh, that I've, I've had a piece in the San Francisco Chronicle book review last week entitled we need the real racist Atticus Finch mm -hmm. um, somewhat so it's not a very subtle title <laughs> but just kind of you know uh, unfolding the idea that um, you know many people were very upset uh, at the discovery that uh, Go set a watchman, you know, features the new Harper Lee novel, uh, features a, a aging 72 year old Atticus Finch who is very angry about the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, has attended a Klan meeting, you know, says some very vicious racist things about, um, about black people. And this is a shock to the narrator, his daughter, who we know as Scout from Mockingbird is, was also a shock to readers because he's this very, you know, idolized um, hero of, of moral integrity. And yeah, you know, I read the book in eighth grade and it was given to me as this race novel that, you know, really shows this very, very good man. And it turns out that even a good man who does a brave thing is not necessarily immune to the white supremacy that's in the air that we breathe, and that looking racism in the eye is actually more complicated than that. And that you can see the seeds of a, a, a patronizing point of view around race in Atticus, in Mockingbird. Yeah. Um, so not to go into all the details, but just to kind of fill it in. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you know, to hear you say that. And, yeah, good. You know, and I have both sides of this. I mean, I'm I'm Latin American. I'm I very much identify as Latin American and as Latina, and I also walk in the world with white privilege. And so I, you know, I I, I know that I am one of the many people who is on the journey of more deeply understanding the white privilege that I carry and live with, and undoing the racism inside of me. I didn't ask to benefit from a system of structural racism. Um, we are all born into it, but we can choose how we respond to it. And and um, and one of the things that I think cripples us in that journey of undoing racism inside of ourselves and around us 
we're crippled when we're, we need to cling to the idea of a, a white savior, like good white people and black and bad white people, excuse me, and sort of separating ourselves from, you know, it's it's complex. And I mean, as I tried to portray in this book, you know, race is complex in Uruguay and Argentina as well. And you know, I strove in this book to portray the racism that Santiago, the black tanguero who leads Dante's group, uh, faces. He faces very real racism um, in the cabarets, especially when they sort of make it to the other side of town and wanted to portray that, you know. I, you know, so I, I have multiracial children of African descent and I feel very invested in, you know, making this world better little by little. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm very delighted to hear you say that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Could you say a little more about the title? What the type, how you came to the title? Yes. I am, my relationship to titles is just very full of drama. <laughs> Every one of my books so far has gone through more or less 100 titles before one settles. And uh, that's just sort of how I work. I just don't know until it's finished and then. So this went through a lot of titles. And about halfway through, I had one title that didn't have the word Dangon in it, and it felt incomplete. Um, it had the word Vesuvius in it, which made sense. She comes from that part of Italy. But I thought, well, but the center of gravity of this book is not in Italy. It's in, it's in Buenos Aires. And then I, it took me a while to get to the gods of Dango. Um, but once I had it, it was the only possible title. I don't know how much I want to say about uh, I don't want to define it for readers. There are many references in the book to, um, to gods. Leda's relationship to God is very complicated. She feels that she would be sort of banished from heaven because of the choices that she's made in life. And so she, you know, she sort of feels rejected by, uh, by the biblical God that she knows. But then she says, maybe there are other gods. Maybe there are these gods that kind of possess me when I'm on stage playing the violin and I'm sort of serving them in this sort of weird renegade religion with no name that is me playing music and being my full self. And so there's, there's kind of a, an ongoing meditation in the book on, on that. And the Greek gods play a role. They're, they kind of, their imagery is kind of uh, through the book, is woven through the book. And that was a, a conscious choice for me. A lot of books have biblical stories as subtext mm -hmm. uh, or, or kind of Jesus subtext. And, and that's one thing that can enrich the underpinnings of a book. Um, and for me, I wanted, to, I wanted to use Greek mythology as that kind of underpinning and reference point um, and subtext. So, it, which felt like it made sense for this story because Leda comes from Southern Italy. And when I went to Southern Italy to research and went to my grandparents' hometown and outside Salerno and so forth, it was just incredible how, to the depth to which you know, the Athena temple ruins are there, and Pais Dome, and you know, and all of the Greek gods are just so present. Pompeii, um, those old cultures are under the surface of southern Italy, Catholic as it may be, that it feels like it's still under the surface of the culture. And so I wanted to explore that as well. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Thank you so Thank much. You. That was incredible. I <laughs> loved hearing you read. And if you are interested in purchasing her book or coming up and speaking with her, please do so. We have her books at our cash registers, and she'll be staying for a little while to meet anybody that would like to talk to her personally. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>